Hi, and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast, focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today, for episode 110, we've got Neil Woodfine from Clavestone talking to us about the Cerberus protocol for business Bitcoin storage. But first, a message from the show sponsors. Look into Kraken, one of the world's leading Bitcoin exchanges. I've been really impressed with the way they operate. They're known for having a very strong focus on security with Kraken Security Labs. They are one of the longest standing Bitcoin exchanges and they've got a high quality platform offering some of the best liquidity in the industry. They've got high trading volume and low fees with no minimum or hidden fees. Kraken have 24-7 support, and on the institutional and business solution side, they are providing best-in-class accounting, reconciliation, and reporting services for cryptocurrency hedge funds, asset managers, and fund administrators. Kraken have an OTC desk for those higher-touch large block trades. They offer five fiat currencies and also offer margin and futures trading. To learn more and sign up, go to the Kraken link in the show notes. Next, if you're looking for ways to improve your setup with multi-signature, look into Unchained Capital. They're doing Bitcoin financial services, and one of their products is a two of three keys multi-signature vault product. So you can use Trezor or Ledger, and you can distribute your keys, which helps protect you against that proverbial $5 wrench attack. Unchained also offers Bitcoin collateralized loans, so you can get USD liquidity without selling your Bitcoins. So while that loan is outstanding, your Bitcoin is stored in a dedicated multi-signature address under collaborative custody with Unchained, holding one of three keys. You hold a second key, and Unchained's independent third-party key agent holding the third key. So to sign up, go to unchained-capital.com. There's a link in the show notes. So carrying on with the Bitcoin custody series, today my guest is Neil Woodfine. He is working at Blockstream, but for this interview, he's speaking in his capacity with Clavestone. So they're a business built around the idea of helping businesses secure their Bitcoins using Cerberus Protocol. Cerberus Protocol is a multi-signature pro- protocol that's designed to be less technically onerous to use and therefore more usable. Uh, so note, this episode is more relevant for businesses and perhaps for small families, but I think you'll still pick up a lot of insight into how this industry has worked with Bitcoin storage. So here's the interview. Neil, welcome back to the show. Hi, Stefan. Thanks for having me on. It's been uh, something like over 100 episodes uh, since I had you on. So uh, you're one of my first few. I think you're in like the first 10. I can't remember now. (laughs) Yeah, that was great. Thanks very much. Yeah. So Neil, I know you're working on this concept. Well, I know you're working mainly at Blockstream, but I know you're also working on this Cerberus protocol and also Clavestone. So uh, can you just give us a bit of an overview uh, what is it and why was it written? Um, so the Cerberus protocol was um, or is a guide for businesses to set up their own Bitcoin self-storage. Um, I think it's common knowledge for everybody that um, hodlers, individuals should be holding their own keys, uh, not your own keys, not your not your Bitcoin. Um, it's something that everybody knows and talks about a lot. But for businesses, um, I think a lot of people seem to think that it's okay for them to be holding their funds with custodians. And that's partic- uh, that's um, especially for uh, things like funds and family offices um, and people like quote the, 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 the regulatory requirements and how difficult it, difficult it is for companies to do their own self-storage. Well, it is pretty damn difficult for individuals to store their own Bitcoin in general. So um, yeah, the Cerberus protocol is, is basically a, a guide for businesses to coordinate self-storage of Bitcoin in um, a simple, um, easy-to-use way. Um, I think, as well, like uh, with companies, they, they they face a lot of very unique issues that don't apply to um, individual Bitcoin storage. So. Um, with a company, the company itself cannot hold the Bitcoin. If you're an individual holding Bitcoin, the, the ownership is very, very clear. You hold the keys, you decide when the payment's getting sent, you decide what addresses the, the payments are getting sent to. But with a company, it's kind of like a virtual entity that's holding these Bitcoins. And you're, the vir- this virtual entity has to um, uh, use agents, generally employees or shareholders, 
to hold the, um, the, the keys on behalf of the company. And that kind of changes the dynamic um, for um, how this, this storage is executed. Um, and another key difference is, now I know there's a lot of multi-sig options for, for individuals, but a company pretty much definitely has to use multi-sig. And if they're using multi-sig, you're involving multiple people and multiple people when they're working together have to know how to coordinate. And right now there's a lot of Bitcoin storage solutions, um, technical storage solutions, software, hardware, um, and it's great. Like to an extent, some people might, might disagree with me on this, but um, uh, the technical side of Bitcoin storage has been solved. There are some really nice, really secure solutions on the market right now. They can definitely be improved, but they're working. But these, these solutions don't provide a business any kind of indication, any kind of instructions on how to coordinate certain things, such as like, how should you um, generate your private keys? Um, when you're receiving a payment from a third party, how should you be like, let's say you've got three people involved in multi-sig, who's the person that's going to be providing that address and how do they make sure that they, they haven't been compromised and, they, and the, 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 the person that's sending the Bitcoin, how do they know that this, this address comes from uh, the company that's asking for it? Um, and then sending payments, obviously, like, so who initiates that transaction? Who confirms it? And if they confirm it, what kind of checks are they doing to make sure that the transaction is legitimate? And like the, cur the current solutions in the market right now are just like, okay, um, here's multi-sig, you all hold a key, go for it. And it's like, I think for anybody that's not a, um, a Bitcoin company or like has Bitcoin expertise within their team, it's a very big ask. And they, and with without those kind of instructions, it's going to be a lot, they're going to feel a lot more comfortable going with a custodian. Um, and obviously, um, if they're going with custodians, it's, it's important to point out that like there's a lot of professional custodians on the market right now. I think there was a big there was a big boom kind of last year um, in, in in various different companies coming up with different custodial solutions. But most of them are kind of holding the keys on behalf of their companies, and and perhaps they discovered that there was more de demand for that. But the problem here is that if you're a company storing your Bitcoin with with a custodian, you're not really reducing the risks. You're just pushing them off to the custodian. Now, if the custodian is using multi-sig and, and they're using like physical vaults and stuff, that's great. But they have their own employees, their own agents, which are carrying these private keys and they're exposed to all of the exact same risks. Um, and to some extent, these custodians are actually, um, the risks are even uh, more concentrated because they have multiple different companies' funds held um, within their own, uh, within their multi-sig, within their within their, uh, uh, their, their, uh, their vaults. They have a, a small number of people holding very large numbers of funds. Um, and that, that obviously poses extra risk. So if we end up in a situation like, let's say, five years from now, where Bitcoin becomes even more popular than it already is, and we have even more kind of institutional investors, we have... A lot of companies um, throwing uh, throwing their fear at this. Um, we could end up with a very very fragile um, ecosystem where there's a very large quantity of Bitcoin funds being held in a small number of centralized custodians. And I think it's very important that um, uh, just regular companies um, understand that this this is a potential risk further down the line and. They need to also understand the benefits of distributing that control, having the, the keys themselves in the same way that I think um, individuals understand the, the, the benefits of that now. Excellent. So what you're touching on, touching on there is this idea that there is both a local risk and a global risk, right? So of not holding the keys. And part of that in some sense is the ethos of Bitcoin that you should, you know, not your keys, not your coins, not just for individuals, but for businesses and potentially for smaller businesses, it might be more feasible for them to do their own self custody using a multi-signature protocol such as a Cerberus protocol. So let's talk about 
who it's mainly intended for. As I understand, it's there for company, Bitcoin companies or companies who handle Bitcoin. And is it mainly for technically unskilled users? That's is that is that the idea? So it's specifically targeted at companies, um, not individuals. Like if you're an individual, don't even bother looking at this. Um, however, it could technically be used by other groups, I think, such as like if you're a family investing in Bitcoin together or like a charity or, or, or some other kind of um, uh, uh, group organization. Um, it's intended for um, long-term Bitcoin holdings. So a low frequency of transactions. Um, some people might want to say it's cold storage. I'm a bit hesitant to call it cold storage because I think that often comes with connotations such as like pure air gapping, whereas we're using, for example, um, Trezors, which are uh, connect via USB. It's not, um, uh, it's not genuine air gapping. So like, I'm not sure whether to call it cold storage, but it's certainly meant for somebody that's making a long-term investment, uh, a company that's making a long-term invest investment in Bitcoin and is only planning to make a transaction perhaps at most once a week, um, but hopefully a bit less than that. And I think the next um, thing I was keen to touch on is just to motivate it for some listeners. Maybe there are listeners out there and they're working with a small Bitcoin company and they're not using a very secure method of storing their Bitcoins, right? And I think we've all heard some of these stories of Bitcoin companies, maybe some, some of them small, some of them large, and they're not necessarily using very secure methods of storage. Have you got any stories you can share with us, obviously without doxing the companies involved or the people involved, uh, of perhaps what we might call inadequate storage given the, the amount of money being stored or the size or the type of that business? Yeah, um, so I mean, like I've been working in the industry for quite some time now. Um, and uh, throughout the last few years, I've heard some pretty shocking, scary stories of prominent Bitcoin companies, like well-known names, um, uh, holding Bitcoin in, in, in ways that I wouldn't consider to be particularly secure. And like we're talking like uh, ledgers thrown in drawers kind of thing. Like... Um, <laughs> I think people think that the the industry has um, learned its lessons and professionalized, but uh, I don't personally. I'm not confident that that's that's the case. Um, and as well, like you have to bear in mind, like the, the driver behind Cerberus is to create some kind of formalized um, a process around uh, Bitcoin storage that, like, the community has checked and we we agree on um not nothing like that exists right now so every single individual company is coming up with their own ad hoc solution now if you if you're a bitcoin specialist there's an argument that that's okay like even then like i think some of them will make mistakes but for everybody else like any other company that doesn't have that expertise on the team they need some kind of um uh standardized way of of holding the Bitcoin. Now, standardize, as well, there's another risk that by standardizing Bitcoin storage, like we, in the Cerberus protocol, we're very explicit about where you should be storing your, your seed, uh, seed phrases, uh, where you should be storing your hardware wallets. By making that very, very explicit, there is the risk that like it provides kind of a guidebook to uh, uh, attackers to, to, to compromise the, the storage. But I think the alternative is much worse where you get all of these um, uh, individual companies coming up on their own with their own solutions. They're not like experts in, in OPSEC. They're not experts in, in, in Bitcoin um, uh, storage, cryptography, any of this. Um, so I think it, it's important that we come up with something that is standardized that anybody, anybody can follow. And it is um, intended for, I mean, I think you have to have a basic technical um, uh, understanding, like you need to be able to navigate around like Windows or a Mac. Um, that's like the, the, the basic requirements. Um, but like it's, it's intended for people that like don't know how to do any coding. They perhaps have never really, um, uh, engaged with Bitcoin very much in the past. It, it's, it's really, really, um, step by step, do this, do that. Like we even like kind of provide directions for, um, 
coordinating um, booking a meeting with your your fellow signatories. So like uh, it, it's it tries to leave nothing out, but at the same time be extremely lean. So it doesn't provide any, uh, like we took a lot of inspiration from the Glacier Protocol, which is a storage solution for individuals. It's very well respected. Um, it's been used by a lot of people. It's been checked by a lot of the, the technical community in the past. Um, oh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Damn it. Yeah. So, I mean, as it's been, uh, you're making the point there that it's there are comparisons with the Glacier Protocol. And so from my own reading of Glacier Protocol and reading of Cerberus, uh, I notice that Cerberus has been really cut down and made a bit more lean for people. So it's not as, say, secure as Glacier, obviously. Uh, so Glacier makes, you know, very specific call outs about all manner of things like side channel attacks and, you know, verifying doubly and so on. Whereas I think there is, and there is a fair point to be made around usability as well, right? So it can be difficult for a user when they try to go to a website and read the procedure and then they're confronted with this massive, massive document and they've got to read through the whole thing before they can even get started. It, it can be a bit confronting. Whereas perhaps if you have set it up in a more lean way, they might actually use that protocol and actually go and use multi-signature as opposed to leaving the Trezor in the drawer kind of thing or the ledger in a drawer somewhere kind of uh, approach to securing the company's assets, uh, Bitcoins. Exactly. So, yeah. I think it might be good to just talk through some of the main threats. So you were speaking before about how there is that principal agent problem that any business or government even faces, right? Uh, what are some of the main threats that you could see in terms of ways a business might lose Bitcoins by not securing it correctly? So um, you've got two uh, main kinds of threat from our perspective. You've got external threats, and these are pretty much the same as the, as the threats um, uh, experienced by individuals storing Bitcoin. So you've got hacks, um, physical theft, and like physical theft can take many different forms. Like you could get moked, um, your house could get broken into, your office could get broken into. Um, you've got uh, kidnapping and ransom, pretty horrible things, but they're already starting. Like um, Jimson Lop has got a really good record online of all of these um, uh, physical attacks on Bitcoin holders that are starting to happen now. Um, you got blackmail. It's very difficult to detect. People can kind of like um, be threatened and then start acting of their own, like of their own volition on, on compromising the Bitcoin storage. And then you got social engineering, which I think many um, exchanges have experienced or at least claim to have experienced um, in the past few years. So they're the external threats. Um, but with a company, uh, you have like a whole unique set of threats that are internal, um, and that looks like inside jobs. So um, you could have like um, uh, um, three signatories and one of them could be compromised. You could be interested in taking the, the company's funds, um, but also like Bitcoin's very new. The software um, could still be improved in terms of its usability. Um, there's a lot of room for error. And when you make an error in Bitcoin, like that's it, you lost your Bitcoin. Um, so you've also got like this kind of, what I would call a fat finger error. Um, so sending the wrong amount, sending it to the wrong address, just pure um, mistakes. You could, as well, like there's a risk when you're receiving as well that you provide um, uh, uh, an address that's wrong. Um, and then another additional internal threat or problem that companies face is people leaving the company. Like companies are fluid. Like you could have shareholders selling their shares. You could have an employee who gets terminated for um, whatever reason. Um, and you could even have deaths within the company, which could cause a lot of headaches. Um, and then, um, like, I think there's two key problems to, to, to highlight uh, um, that are unique to companies. So for the external threats, um, it's not the business that's facing the threat. It's like, okay, like the business could lose its Bitcoin. But like these Bitcoin don't belong to the, the agents that are carrying the keys. So if I'm one of the signatories... And like I say, I'm just like an employee. Um, I'm not even a shareholder. I'm taking on physical risk on behalf of the company. And like that's that's an unusual situation to be in. Like perhaps if I'm threatened, I don't really have much incentive to um, uh, refuse any 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 kind of requests. Um, and then with regards to the internal threats, you also have um, uh, a unique situation where 
uh, you have plausible deniability. So the the difference between like a hack and somebody just uh, or the, the some signatories getting together and stealing the Bitcoin, it, like you can't can't really tell the difference. And so it gives um, inside jobs like um, a higher risk of success because th there's a good chance they can get away with it. They can blame it. And I'm, I'm sure I'm absolutely certain we've already seen a number of these um, within the industry already exchanges quite regularly talk about getting hacked. Um, like it could be in the future that we see some of these professional custodians also claiming to have been hacked, but actually it's just some of their internal employees um, um, taking, taking the funds for themselves. And like as a law enforcement or anybody monitoring the blockchain, how do you um, uh, distinguish between uh, a hack and, and that inside job? Very difficult. Right. Yeah. Great point. So uh, let's talk also about insurance as well. So if you're a company, you may be looking at insurance for Bitcoin. And I know you wrote uh, some articles in relation to this. So what were some of your thoughts around the problems with insurance for Bitcoin storage? Um, so uh, just to be clear up front, I'm not an insurance expert by any means. We did a, a little bit of research. Um, to produce our article. So um, I can only kind of talk from from, from the research that we did there. Um, but I'm, I'm very, very skeptical of any um, companies that are claiming to have any serious um, insurance um, for any any Bitcoin holdings or, or cryptocurrency in general. Um, insuring Bitcoin poses a lot of risk for um, insurance companies. Um, generally, they're looking at um, three things. Uh, one is the, the the value of the thing that they're insuring. Um, then they're looking at what the, what events they're insuring against. So like specific events that could that could happen, um, and then the risk of those events happening. So there's like three factors coming into play when they're, they're they're deciding on the premiums. Now with Bitcoin, like how how do you define the value? Like it's very difficult for an insurance company to know how much they're they're insuring because. Bitcoin's value is oscillating. It's very very volatile. Um, it's moving moving all over the place. So it's very difficult for them to get that value right. And then for the events, um, it's very difficult for them to be very specific about uh, the events that they're insuring against. Like we have the problem of um, uh, plausible deniability that I mentioned earlier. It, it makes fraud very um, likely uh, for fraudulent insurance claims. Like insurance companies hate uh, insuring cash, which essentially is what, what what Bitcoin is, because it's very liquid, it's very easy to offload, um, it's very attractive as uh, as a kind of um, insurance fraud option. Um, I think that there's a, there was a really good um, example of um, a data breach. I can't remember the name of the company, but there was a data breach a, a few years ago, um, and they claimed uh, the company that had the insurance claimed for the insurance, but the insurance company refused because they described it as an act of war um, because um, there was uh, indications that it was committed by Russian um, government government agents so the the company never got their never got their pair now like yeah that like if you're in a, a Bitcoin insurance if you're insuring um, uh, um, uh, some Bitcoin holdings you could like be looking at uh, a similar situation and then the risk of things happening there's just not enough data like right now it looks like exchanges get hacked quite often. So that's going to push the premiums very high, but it's very difficult for an insurance company to, to calculate those risks. And so like all these risks, uh, all these difficulties have piled up. And the, the result is that you get some Bitcoin companies claiming to have insurance, but they, they either have ridiculously um, um, expensive fees um, to, to get in on that insurance, or they're only insuring a very, very small portion of uh, the holdings that they're holding. So like this may, may be out of date, Already, this is something uh, some research that we did back in February. But for example, Coinbase Custody, they only so they say that it's an insured solution, but they they're only insuring their hot wallet, and the hot wallet only um, accounts for two percent of their their holdings. And Zappo the same, they're only insuring their their hot wallet again around two percent of their holdings. Um, I think just I think it was just yesterday, um, Knox Custody, um, a newly launched uh, custody service claim to have 100% insurance. Now, like, I'd very much like to see their, their small print. I'm sure there's a lot of caveats to, to, to uh, what they're providing there. Um, 
And then like as well, like uh, let's say they do insure um, just like uh, um, a thought experiment, let's say they insure 100% of, of the holdings, they're probably only going to be able to provide you um, the uh, US dollar amount. And like, when do they fix that US dollar amount? Was it like at the time of the theft or was it um, uh, at the time that they, 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 they approved the, the insurance claim? You have like this like time differential where you could be receiving a lot less than, than, than um, what you originally insured. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of like issues around it as well. You're going to have to buy back those Bitcoin um, if you continue, if you decide you want to continue holding, and when you buy buy back those Bitcoin, you're going to be faced with um, a lot of uh, slippage when you're trying to buy them back on the market. If you're um, a large custodian that's lost a lot of funds, people are going to know that there's going to be this incoming demand. It may push the price up. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a really complicated issue, and I think because insurance is so difficult and so questionable. Um, uh, it's it's even more important for companies to make sure that they have their Bitcoin storage locked down in the same way that individuals recognize that they're not going to get their Bitcoin in, insured and that they have to uh, make sure that their, their, their storage is, is, is in good shape. Yeah, a lot of good points there, Neil. And I think ultimately a lot of that is owing just to how early we are in Bitcoin. It may well be that, you know, if I asked you that same question 10, 20 years from now, maybe it would be a lot more mature then. And maybe by that stage, it would be a more of a normal thing. But it, it may just be an aspect of the world is not quite used to Bitcoin yet. And so we just haven't, all the institutions have not quite caught up. And, it, you know, that's just part of the journey. Yeah, uh, but could, in the meantime, you've got to be could, careful. Could I, could I mention something on that though? Like, um, if you're looking to the future, uh, there's a number of reasons why actually in the future insurance may not even get that much more easy. Like um, right now, um, insurance companies are uh, insured themselves through companies called reinsurers, which insure against like global catastrophes, things that um, are very, very difficult to predict, black swans, that kind of thing. And they're able to do that because they're backed up by government. These reinsurers are backed up by government organizations. So in the US, for example, uh, the reinsurers are guaranteed by the FDIC and they can basically print money to back up the reinsurers who will then um, make the, the insurers able to pay on their on their um, uh, insurance claims. Uh, the problem with that is that with Bitcoin, <laughs> with, if you're investing in Bitcoin, you're predicting or uh, speculating on certain things happening. Um, you're, 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 you're um, perhaps speculating on the death of fiat. Um, uh, central banking may become more difficult. Um, and we could end up en encountering some kind of um, uh, uh, financial disaster. And in those kind of situations, like your insurance isn't going to be particularly useful. You're, the reinsurers are not going to be backed up as well as they are now by um, um, uh, government organizations. Um, and like we, we're going to be in this sound money paradigm where money is very difficult to, to come by. It becomes very, very scarce. So if it's lost, it's going to be very difficult to, to get it back. Um, so I'm kind of, I feel like in that kind of situation, premiums would be even higher. Um, yeah. Uh, so like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, the, the industry is going to mature for sure. But I, I think the entire insurance industry, to some extent, may have to um, change to, to account for this this new kind of um, Bitcoin paradigm that we, we might be heading towards. Yeah, sure. Fair enough. Um, okay. So let's dive into the Cerberus protocol itself. So let's talk a bit about preparing and uh, what are some of the requirements that you need to get arranged? Um, yeah. So uh, first thing you got to do is assemble your team. You got to choose three trusted signatories at, at, your, at your company. Um, should be fairly easy. I think most companies have three people that they, they, they trust. Um, uh, yeah, so you got to get them together uh, and um, prime them for what the Cerberus protocol is. Ideally, everybody needs to um, read through the protocol, although um, we've taken the uh, decision to assign one person the major responsibility of um, implementing the setup stage of the protocol, and we call that the, the master of ceremony, the MC. Um, and the MC 
is packed. Like I think every company has at least one person who is more technically able than the, the rest of the team. And it's the MC's responsibility to, uh, for example, procure a bunch of the equipment that's required. For example, um, the, the hardware wallets. Um, we require a bunch of equipment from Amazon um, to, uh, to, to use during the setup ceremony. Um, uh, and that person is kind of absolutely has to be very familiar with the, the protocol and will be kind of directing the other um, uh, signatories during, during the setup ceremony. Um, and then like other things that you need to do to begin with is um, set up, uh, prepare some physical storage. So um, when you're setting up your, your um, uh, 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 when you're generating your private keys, you're going to create some backups in the form of uh, seed phrases. Um, you don't want to be storing them in the same place as your hardware wallets. That would be a terrible idea. So we recommend using um, bank safe deposit boxes for that. And we have um, some recommendations and protocol around that to make sure that they're not all stored, for example, at the same safe deposit box provider. Um, uh, they're stored under individual names so that um, uh, either the company that you work for can't go out and just claim all of the backups. Um, and also the, the um, safe deposit box providers aren't aware that um, these three um, uh, boxes are connected um, and they can join the dots and, 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 and recreate the wallet. Um, yeah, so I mean, like, we're, we don't explain all of this, um, um, uh, these design decisions within the protocol itself. But what we do is we backload all of that information into an appendix. So I think like, for example, Glacier tries to explain everything as you're going. So you like, you know why you're doing these things. And we found that that just like, it bloats the, the protocol. It provides a lot of information that people are potentially not even that interested in. Um, uh, and we're really kind of keen to make sure that people actually use the protocol because like that's going to be more secure than them not using it. Um, so yeah, uh, gotcha. and then and then in terms of like other preparation, um, you're going to need to get Electrum on a laptop. You're going to need to verify that your um, Electrum install is genuine. Um, and then uh, uh, yeah, you, you're going to basically set a date for your ceremony. And everybody's going to have to uh, get together for a key generation ceremony. And we've really kind of made it very formal. Like um, people have got to switch off their phones. Um, they enter a room that has been kind of checked for um, potential compromises. And like we really get the signatories to take it extremely seriously. That like, okay, this is the most sensitive time of the protocol. Like these seeds that are being generated provide ac people access to any future Bitcoin that you add to the wallet. So like, let, let's get this right. Um, and uh, that, that part of the protocol hasn't been published yet, the setup ceremony. It's very, very close. Um, and we, we should have it out within um, a week or two. Um, so yeah, I don't really want to go into too much detail on that until that's um, uh, finalized. Um, but the, the, the general theme is like, uh, I think like, for example, a lot of people saw the Zcash setup ceremony. Um, it was uh, live recorded. Um, we're going for something a little bit like that. Got it. Okay, great. So I guess just summarizing in terms of the tools required, you need three trusted employees. And I presume then it's a, as I understand, it's a two out of three multi-signature setup. We would have three Trezor ones, the cheap, uh, the cheap uh, hardware wallet device. Uh, you'd have three computers. Uh, and then beforehand, the, those three users or, uh, employees have gone to set up safe deposit box uh, as the backup uh, location for their seed words for each of their respective devices. Uh, and then, yeah, so you would go through that uh, preparation and uh, the setup uh, process. And right, so then let's talk a little bit about the uh, presuming now you've done the setup. Uh, what about things like transition of holders or a staff member leaves or is incapacitated or, you know, you need to rotate in a new key. Is that, that also covered inside the protocol? Yeah. So um, after the setup, the, the, the next sections are um, receiving a transaction. I think a lot of people um, often overlook receiving a transaction, how risky it is. Um, you need to make sure that you're providing the correct address or, You've got to have a bit of redundancy there, a little bit of duplication using multiple different channels to provide that to um, third parties. 
Um, and then the next section would be making a transaction, which is, um, of course, very, very sensitive. Like you, you need to make sure that all the signatories are checking that um, uh, the transaction is genuinely in the interests of the company. It was intended, the amount is correct. The third party's address is correct, that kind of thing. Um, so th those two sections, and then, then we get into uh, 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 sections such as the, the replacement of a key. So you've got two, two different situations here. One is where perhaps one of the keys, uh, the hardware wallets has failed. Um, okay, so now we need to replace one of the hardware wallets. That's very different to, um, okay, one of, one of the employees has quit and like he's a rogue agent now and he holds one of these very, sen <laughs> very, very sensitive keys. Like how do we, how do we deal with those, this situation? That's very, very different from like hardware wallet breaking. So yeah, we, we've got um, protocol around that. Okay, like let's um, set up a new key. Um, let's get the other two remaining signatories to very, very quickly and um, transfer the, the funds to this, um, this new, new wallet that we've, um, we've, we've generated. And like that also will have um, a secure setup uh, around it. Um, but like, yeah, it, th these things are really important. And they're, not, they're not codified anywhere. Right now, people are just kind of making it up as they go along. Um, so it's important to make sure that there's, there's some, some standards around this. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and you mentioned earlier around receipt or the first receive address, let's say, and just in general, the process of receiving address. So uh, are there any guidance? Uh, is there any guidance you can provide there around good practice for receiving into that two of three multi-signature set? For example, is it possible to verify the incoming address on the device, that kind of thing? Um, right, so uh, Trezor provides um, some uh, great solutions for making sure that you uh, you check your um, address on the device before you, um, and not just on your screen, um, which reduces the the, the um, potential for compromises. Um, obviously, if you're getting socially engineered, that that could pose a problem. So um, it's important to make sure that you're checking um, the address that you're receiving from your third party um, on multiple channels and ideally with multiple people. Um, again, though, like this is this part of the um, protocol is um, still under development, so I, I wouldn't really want to give too many specifics on that until it's um, until it's finalized. Gotcha. All right. Um, what about any procedures in terms of shutting it down? I guess is is there anything there that would uh, stick out to the user or things that they might not have thought of before? Um. Shutting the the um, uh, the storage down is not something that we'd considered adding to the protocol yet. Um, I think it would just be as simple as um, coordinating a, a transaction from the three signatories to. Uh, I mean, they're going to be sending the Bitcoin somewhere, right? Um, uh, to whatever new storage they decide to use, um, or to an exchange to liquidate or whatever. But like the the transaction part of the protocol should cover. Um, um, situations such as that, such as emptying the wallet, um, that's not uh, that that's not a big concern. Got it. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, okay, and I think it also might be interesting to talk about segregation of the funds. So typically, you know, an individual might be thinking, okay, I've got my cold storage, which is a more secure setup, and then I've got a day to day balance on my phone or whatever, right? Is there anything, uh, is there any guidance there for a business who is using Cerberus protocol, how they might segregate the funds between, say, the hot wallet and then their Cerberus storage? Um, maybe in a future version. I think uh, right now, the most important thing is to teach people to store Bitcoin long term in a secure manner. And like building that side, this is a side project for us. Um, we all have day jobs. Um, like, Building that uh, that that protocol around the the safe storage is is a big enough task as it is. So yeah. we're we're going to get yep. that right first. We've already had like um, a number of uh, recommendations and feedback from um, uh, people that we know working in the industry. Uh, for example, they've suggested mixing hardware wallets. Like the the the, the problem with like suggestions like that is it it significantly increases the complexity of the protocol, and the bigger it gets. The, the more it's going to put off potential users, the less it's going to get used, the less secure Bitcoin storage is going to be be out there. So um, 
yeah, we're, we're going to focus on that, um, that, that kind of core model first, and then we can think about uh, maybe doing extensions, um, separate versions, that kind of thing. Another thing to, to actually I haven't mentioned so far is that we've taken the decision to make sure that we don't provide any, any choices to the users. So it's like, um, I think the Glacier protocol in some sections is like, okay, well, you can do it like this, or if you want to like add a bit of extra security, you can do it like that. We want to avoid all of that. And it's just like, this is the most standard way of storing Bitcoin in a multi-sig multi -sig manner for a company. Um, because I think people shouldn't be making subjective judgments like that. Somebody, sh especially companies that aren't familiar with Bitcoin, they should um, uh, just kind of be told what to do. And I think most companies would actually prefer that. Um, so like, this is open source, right? Anybody can use it. We, we haven't copyrighted it or anything like that. Um, so I, if people really feel like there's a need for something with um, mixed hardware wallets, or um, it needs to have some kind of hot cold um, um, protocol in there, they can um, fork it. They can change bits um, and like release their own release their own, vo own version. And like, I really hope that Cerberus becomes kind of just a basis for the industry to come to some kind of uh, consensus on how to do um, very standard multi-sig security um, in a in a um, secure in a secure way. Right. Yeah. And I can definitely appreciate the usability concern that you've got as well, because it can be a bit daunting if somebody picks up the protocol and, and it's just too detailed and there's just too much, they might not actually go through with using it at all. So I, I guess you are sort of uh, trying to ride the edge in terms of what's that right balance that you can get the user to adopt something that's more secure uh, while at the same time uh, not making not making too many trade-offs that you know might impinge on the security of the overall setup set you know for example not using multi multi sig multi sorry multi hardware for the multi signature um, but I, I think some of that will become easier over time because hopefully uh, you know electrum will have sort of easier uh, or inbuilt setup for some of these so for example to do like cold card and trezor might be more feasible uh once a certain pull request is or once i think there's like a pull request that's already been merging in and once the next main release of electron comes out that might make it easier as well you can, you can already do mixed you can already do mixed hardware wallets with electrum it's it's still possible um i, I think like the, the interface could be improved but i mean that's that's electrum in general right um, it's a great wallet. Don't, don't get me wrong. Like those guys have done an incredible job, but like, I think the UI, um, has, still has a lot of room for improvement. Um, but yeah, you can, you can already do mixed, mixed hardware wallets. We, we, we tried in the early stages of development of, um, uh, Clearstone with, uh, treasures and ledgers, but we found that like it worked, but there was a lot of bugs, a lot of errors thrown, and we didn't think that was going to, um, be encouraging for anybody trying to deploy deploy the protocol. So just make it super super yeah. simple. I mean, right now, like I say, you've got companies out there storing um, Bitcoin on a single Trezor, like put in a drawer or in a vault somewhere. Like this is already like multi sigging that up is already a significant improvement. So like let's get there first and 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 think about improvements in the future as well. Like um, we're still in quite early stages of like the software and the hardware. Um, like I hope in the future, um, there'll be more uh, uh, user-friendly solutions and then we can start incorporating that into the protocol and like reducing whole sections that have been automated through software. Uh, potentially as well, like if Cerberus proves to be um, uh, uh, useful for people and it gets a decent amount of adoption, like the, people could release like Cerberus companions that like um, directs people like what to do next and and that kind of thing. Although as well, when you're whenever you're introducing new software, you're also introducing new risks because it can tell people to do the wrong thing um, or provide like compromised addresses or, or that kind of thing. So for example, in our protocol, we couldn't find any way around getting the user to verify their Electrum install, which is pretty daunting, I think, for a, um, um, a, a basic computer um, uh, user. But like we just like okay, we can't have people using electrums that they haven't verified, uh, so it just has to go in. There's like there's always trade offs, um, but sometimes you just there's no way around it. And uh, let's just talk about Clavestone just generally. Can you just give us an update on Clavestone generally? 
Yeah, um, so I haven't mentioned it all uh, up to this point. Um, Cliffstone was started a couple of years ago. Um, we had um, an idea for a product which we called um, um, uh, uh, Shed Storage. So um, I think um, Unchained Capital call it collaborative custody. And we kind of taken inspiration from a couple of um, um, articles. One was um, Daniel Kravitz's Bitcoin's Rugged Individualism, which I'd highly recommend to everybody. Um, he describes the agency problem with uh, Bitcoin storage for organizations um, and suggests that in the future, we'll have like these dedicated organizations that will hold a portion of the keys, but not all of them. Um, and that reduces the, the, the concentration of funds risk that we see with regular custodians today. And then also there was an Anton um, Antonio Antonopoulos um, uh, video at the Canadian Senate hearing. And he also describes in that video the, um, the flexibility of models that Bitcoin provides with its um, smart contracting. Um, we could see a future with new forms of uh, Bitcoin banks, again, with this kind of uh, sharing of keys. So we wanted to build um, a, a, a shared storage platform for companies to, to, to um, store their Bitcoin. But our first trials um, didn't get, get a lot of interest. And it took us quite a while to develop some of, like, for example, the setup ceremony comes straight from, from that model. Um, we'd learned a lot from the research that we'd done. We thought we'd, um, we'd, uh, uh, um, we had a lot of important, valuable knowledge that like the Bitcoin industry could benefit from. And we didn't want to just like close it down entirely. So that uh, uh, created the birth of uh, Cerberus. Perhaps in the future, we may, we may prov uh, start providing. Um, um, so in the future, you may be providing Clavestone Consulting. Yes. So uh, we're hoping Cer Cerberus kind of um, um, generates some interest in uh, secure Bitcoin self-storage. And I think um, if, that, if that takes off, then uh, yeah, we'd, we'd be very interested in helping companies set up their own storage, whether it's with Cerberus or or um, modifications of it. Um, and then as well, like perhaps in the future, we'd also like to explore, re-explore the, the shared, shared storage model that we originally originally conceived. At the time that we're recording this, right, September 2019, it's pretty much if you want to do your own multi-sig right now, the only way is Electrum. But, uh, or if you're more technical, you might be able to do it with hardware wallet interface. But again, that's you know requiring a custom fork or custom... Uh, to use like the fork of Bitcoin rather than using direct Bitcoin core. And it looks to me like there are new options that are around the corner, but they're not quite here yet. So Justin Moon has his junction project, Stepan Snijarev and the crypto advanced team have the Spectre project as well, which hopefully these will provide viable options that people can just do their own multi-sig, ideally with multiple hardware wallets and maybe those could uh, also make this whole thing a little bit easier for everyone. Yes, definitely. Um, there's lots of people working on lots of interesting things. Um, and like, I, I want to make sure that uh, Cerberus is kind of a live document that we uh, develop over time. So we'll be doing our best to incorporate some of those into, into making it more secure and more, more user-friendly. Fantastic. Well, look, I think they're the key points uh, to touch on with Cerberus. Did you have anything else you wanted to mention? I think we've covered everything. Um, there's some really good questions there. Great. Okay. Well, look, just uh, for the listeners who aren't familiar, can you just uh, just tell them where they can find it, find all the right relevant links and find you as well? Um, so you can find me on Twitter um, uh, at uh, nwoodfine. Also, the Cerberus protocol is available at cerberus.clavestone.io. Um, and then for anybody that's looking to uh, contribute or make some uh, very kind of cutting comments and and uh, ask us some difficult questions. You can uh, find us on GitHub at uh, Clavestone slash Cerberus. We really welcome any kind of um, uh, extra eyes on the project. We've already had some fantastic feedback from um, some, some of the people we know in the industry. So uh, yeah, hoping we can get some more of that. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining me today, Neil. Yes, thanks a lot, Stefan. Always a pleasure. All right, so that's the interview. Just one point Neil made to me in the post-interview comments was just that he wanted to also mention the state risk as well. So 
consider it this way. If everyone puts all their Bitcoins with custodians, then the government can come to a large custodian and potentially confiscate those Bitcoins or perhaps try to influence that custodian to try to fork the protocol into a direction that Bitcoin hodlers may disagree with. And so from that point of view, it's also a good idea to help businesses self-custody where that is possible. And in doing so, you may be adding to Bitcoin's anti-fragility. That said, note that the Cerberus protocol is making certain security trade-offs when compared with, say, Glacier protocol. However, it's doing these for the purposes of usability and given that using multi-signature would be better than the current alternative that some Bitcoin businesses are using, it's worth thinking about if, if you're running a Bitcoin business. So with that in mind, go experiment with the Cerberus protocol and make your own suggestions or comments on the protocol. I think there are benefits for businesses using a standard, simple protocol for safe storage of their Bitcoins. And if you're bullish like I am, there will be a need for these things in the years to come. So lastly, find the show notes, the transcript, and the link to subscribe to my podcast on my website, stefanlevera.com. That's it for me. Thanks, guys, and I will see you in the Citadels.